In my life and career, I've been privileged to meet and observe the work of countless photographers. Some are masters, while others are just emerging. But they have each committed to the art of photography. For them, it's not just about creating a technically competent photograph. It's about using tools and techniques to express something about themselves and the way they experience the world. They understand that their photographs are incomplete until someone else has the opportunity to gaze upon it and have their own special experience. The best of these people know that it's not about emulating someone else's style or technique, but taking the uniqueness of themselves, flaws and all, and communicating something that only they could express. It's not an easy thing to do, but sometimes such work demands us to be rigorously honest, vulnerable, and open to the unexpected surprises of both life and art. I've seen Ellen Friedlander do just that over the years that I've known her. Her self-portraits, as well as her unique take on street photography, reveal a woman who is willing to take the raw material of her life and use it to make work infused with visual beauty and raw and deep emotion. And so I had made the first Street Extended, which was Bird Market, out of a photograph that I knew I really loved, but I didn't, but I didn't, you know, we're inundated with photographs outside here. And I know that for me, it's been really important for me to find my own point of view and my own way of speaking and my own vocabulary. And that was, that was my beginning. We'll talk to Ellen about her lifelong commitment to photography in various roles and how she used a painful personal chapter in her life to transform herself and her work. This is Ibarian X, and welcome back to The Candor Frame. All right, Ellen, welcome yeah. to the show. Thank you, Ibarian Good to X. Have you. I'm very grateful to be here. Uh, it's my pleasure. My pleasure. It's it, interesting because I've kind of known you, I guess, two, three years? Two so, years. Two years now? Mm-hmm. So it's, it's been really interesting to sort of observe your progression because I've seen you evolve pretty dramatically in that, in that short period of time, which is really interesting. And then when I was doing the research, I saw that you know, you've always been involved in photography from going back to, to school, but it seems like it's been the last several years that have been like a real catalyst for you in a variety of ways. So I really want, that's really why I wanted to have you mm-hmm. on the show, because as much as I like people's work, their stories for me are much more fascinating than anything else. You got good pictures. Thank you. But I think you also have a good story, so that's why I kind of want to peel the onion with you, if you don't mind. Well, Ibaranex, you happen to be the first person I sat next to when I came to L.A. for Street Week two years ago, or whenever it was. Like I was in Orange County, Mm -hmm. and I was um, alone, and I was buried in my work, and I was basically trying to find my people. And Mm -hmm. so I got brave enough to come to L.A. by myself, not knowing a soul. And I remember you speaking at Street Week, and I was sitting in the back row, and then there was a break or something, and I ended up sitting next to you towards the end. And we had a little bit of an exchange, mm-hmm. and I was like, okay, I, okay, we can, do, I can do this. And it's just, it was just that kind of, so you've been a really specifically, you were a little angel to me in that day because I was really alone in, in Santa Ana doing my work. Oh. Yeah, I know. I appreciate that. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I've kind of learned in life that those small little gestures can make a huge, huge difference, yeah. even if you're not aware of them. That's why it pays to be kind. It does, yeah, yeah. and helpful. And it's okay to share information with people because it's always different. Everybody yeah. does it differently. Well, thank you for that. Mm-hmm. Well, one of the things I, was, I wanted to start the conversation with, because I know that you studied art and photography, but you wrote something about having a, a session with Emmett Gowan that was a real pivotal moment in terms of you. You're already, you're already interested in photography, but somehow that that presentation from Emmett really did something for you that that sort of changed you. Tell me about what you were about at that moment. And you may want to explain who Emmett is for people who, who don't know. But what was it that you saw in that presentation that was such so moving to you? 
So I picked up a camera at 16. I was a figure skater. And so I had oh, all okay. my energy had gone into figure skating. So like 25 hours a week and getting up early in the morning. And when I left that, I was empty. And so I don't remember how I picked up a camera, but I picked up a camera. So then I chose to go to Ithaca College to study. Mm-hmm. And Ithaca College had a great photography department, photojournalism school and all that. And I was sitting in my senior thesis class with Danny Guthrie, who I'm still friends with. He was here last week for the opening. Oh, okay. Yeah, nice. and Monty Gerlach. But I was sitting in the senior, senior thesis, and there was like 12 of us in the class. And we had Emmett Gowan there. And I'll never forget, I was literally this close. What we were like, we're three feet apart from each other. And, and he was just sharing his photographs of his wife, Edith, and in mm. the lake. And Emmett Gowan was, you know, beautiful black and white photographer who did that every day and made it transitional for me. And he, I just, I have it on my refrigerator actually at home and I, his words. And he, he was all about, he found his wife and it was all about her environment that really he liked photographing the everyday and mm-hmm. and the everyday for him was different that he grew up with. And I just saw this, I said to myself, this is what I want to do. And that was that. I mean, it was just like an aha moment. And I was all of what, 21 years old. And I was just like, this is it. But then, you know, you have to figure out how to do it. And I was given great skills at Ithaca College in photography, great skills, but I didn't have like the self-confidence that Mm -hmm. one needs to go out and like be a photographer. And I just said, okay. And so I went more into the art direction, art, and I did a lot of photography on the side to just educate myself. I don't know if I answered you. No, you didn't. Okay, good. You did. You know, when you saw the work, what kind of work were you making? Was it the kind of typical student work? What, oh, it's so funny. Because you're saying that, because you're speaking, when you speak of Emmett's work, besides his amazing landscapes, the, the, the images of his wife are really intimate photographs that he spent a lifetime with her making. Mm-hmm. So what did you see in his photographs that you weren't seeing in yours at the time? Oh, it gave me permission to do what I'd always loved doing, which was photographing everything. And Mm. I would go home from school and photograph my my grandparents. I'd take the 4 by 5 camera from college and borrow it for the weekend and go home because it was two and a half hours from home and my grandparents were both alive at the time. And I would... It would be Friday night dinner, and my grandmother had cooked up the storm. I go, okay, well, after dinner, I'm going to make a photograph. And I have this photograph with the four by five. I still have it today, where my grandfather's laying on the couch, my grandmother's sitting on her couch reading the paper. And it was just, I loved documenting my every day. And seeing that work gave me permission. It was like, okay. I just keep doing this mm-hmm. and it's 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 a real form. It's an art form. And yeah, yeah, I, I completely get that. Yeah. So as you were, you know, finding work in the arts and you weren't really doing it as 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 a photographer, were you still making those kinds of pictures? I have been photographing. So I went to Washington DC after Ithaca College. I picked mm-hmm. up like a week. I had no money and like two hundred dollars to my name. Anyway, so I, my cousin Lisa, who has been my cheerleader, one of them, I moved in with her for a week, and I found a place to live. And I actually did work for photographers. I've always worked for photographers my entire life. It's just not written down. And I ended up first getting involved in an art project with Washingtonian artists and New York City artists. And there was an old hotel in downtown Washington D.C. that they were going to dem- demolish, mm-hmm. and they gave it to the the two sets of artists to come in and we had five days and then it was an opening and then it would be demolished. So I documented the entire project. So I documented the whole entire project. I photographed another artist, John Hadelberg, and I was part of an installation project with Ann Stoddard. So I've, it's just, it was just like, I just have always kind of done crazy things when they seemed right for me to do, if mm-hmm. that makes sense. And my camera's always been one of those things that I've used as a tool for survival, basically. So when you say you were working for photographers, were you working as a rep? But what role were you uh-huh. playing in these in, the, in this in these different photographers' uh, okay. life and business? Okay, so I worked for Peter Garfield, who was a Washingtonian photographer. I called him every week. This is what you did back in those days. Mm-hmm. Um, there was... 
I called every week to say, I really want to work for you. And finally, after like probably six months, he was like, I'm so tired of <laughs> getting this call. And so he took me in. And so I was, in, I, he had me an assistant. You know, I did the assistant thing and I, we did shoots at the Capitol and I'll never forget. I was the second assistant on the job and it was like, you know, a 6 a.m. call and we're at the foot of the, the Capitol steps and we're shooting these senators. I'll never forget it. I can see it in my mind's eye. And the equipment was bigger than me, you know? <laughs> and I'm like thinking to myself, like, I'm 22 years old and I'm thinking, you know, I really know this is the way I should work to get better at what I want to do. This is what they say to do, but I, I can't do it. It's just too heavy for me. So Peter was really kind. He did amazing work, um, had a great studio in Georgetown. And he allowed me, he first had me go into the office. I printed for him. I did stuff in the studio. I just did all sorts of office things. So he was my first foray. He was like my big jump. Yeah. And then after Peter, where'd I go? I don't remember, but I've wrapped and I've styled and I've, I've, I was director of print in St. Louis, Missouri for a couple years. I'll never forget Kimora Perkins, who is, was Kimora, I can't think of her real last name. Anyways, she walked in at 12. She was 13, you know, 13. She was six feet tall. She was the real deal. Mm -hmm. You know, in St. Louis at the time to have a real model walk in was like, and 13, she was, Anyway, so I've had all those kinds of experiences, every aspect that you can you can have to build the knowledge I've been I've done my entire life. So you said earlier that it was insecurity that didn't allow you to make the leap, but here you were learning how different photographers work, learning all the things that you never learned in school in terms of Working with clients, getting work. I mean, your persistence in getting getting that first initial job is an essential skill of having that kind of tenacity. Was there anything else other than insecurity that, that prevented you from just saying, let me just see if I can do this on my own? Yes. I really wanted to have babies. Mm. I mean, I just really, I knew the kind of person I am. I'm 100%. I'm 120%. So I knew that for me to have a career as a as an, a photographer would mean that I would have to do that. Mm-hmm. And I just really wanted to have a family and babies first. And I knew that the career was never going to go away. It may be delayed and I could work on it. But if I, if I could have that other part of my life, I didn't want to delay it. I yeah. didn't want to do that. So that was what it was. I made that, I did make that choice. And I feel so good about that choice because being a mother is like the best thing that I've ever done. And I love my babies and I photographed them. My poor son, he was born and I photographed him every single day, every single day. I mean, his first year is like, boom, there it is. And the role, the everything. And then my, my daughter came along four and a half years later and she didn't quite get the everyday photograph because Mm -hmm. then you're juggling two babies, but she got, other photographs you know she got i was i was a little bit more more like i didn't do every day yeah but did you feel like during that time that you were still being able to sustain your creativity throughout that time because sometimes when people go through that stage of raising kids the kids just dominate everything they become all your spare time is dedicated to them right right and so all the things that you used to do to take care of yourself get supplanted and it's hard for people to hold on to those practices that allow them to be creative, whether it's photography, whether it's writing, whether it's pottery, whatever it is. Tell me about, about that uh, during the time that you were raising your kids. Well, I had a few angels with me. David, my ex, we had, we had Skylar in Ocala, Florida, which was purgatory. Oops, sorry, but it was for me. <laughs> Anyways, so, but I got a master's and I had a baby. And during that time, he got an opportunity to move to Hong Kong. And so I was like, Hong Kong is a little far away. But 24 hours in Hong Kong, I was like, oh, I can do this. And we got a wonderful helper. And Josie, Josie was referred to us by the people who lived in the flat that we move into. Mm-hmm. And Josie was with us for 15 years. And she was an angel. It, it's very normal to have somebody live with you in a place like Hong Kong because it's real. It, at the time that I moved there in 1995, it was 
to have a baby and to get around and to navigate and it could rain like torrential rain. I remember the first time I went to the bus stop, I had to go back home because it decided to rain and I was wetter than any shower I had ever taken. (laughs) Okay. So I was like, okay, so having somebody there because you had, you have a, a stroller and you have to walk upstairs, you have to, you have to carry it. It, it. It was just, so I had that freedom to be able to, you know, work, to always have my camera and to, once the babies, once I had them at a certain place and I, even when they were little, I just always photographed them. Yeah. And then I had a friend that I met, Joanna James, who's, She's now in London and she has a gallery there. But we met on the floor of a play group and she was an entrepreneur. So she was having a shoot. She got into making angel costumes and she had me come with Skylar to do the shoot. And there they are on this shoot. We're in the Kowloon side and I see this photographer. I see this, you know, I'm like, I could do this. And so I said to his rep, I thought at the time, Helen, I said, you know, I did this in the United States. I'm kind of good at repping and I understand the whole photography thing. You know, I don't know if you're interested in a little help to meet more people in the expat community. And they were like, whoosh, right on me. (laughs) Boom. And so I worked with Helen and Simon for 10 years. Yeah. So while I was in Hong Kong, it was, I always had that creative outlet and it was amazing. Simon didn't speak any English, not a word all Cantonese, and Helen spoke English. So I would, but Simon and I totally meshed creatively. Mm-hmm. And so it was it was just a wonderful partnership. Well, now, now you looking for your tribe here in LA, now I'm getting a better understanding of why that was so important. Mm-hmm. Because you seem to have always had that. And that seemed to be that, whether it was at school or even after school when you moved to Hong Kong, that's how you helped sustain it by is finding right. finding people to to encourage you and nurture you and right yeah 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 I I just it's a forty four year passion <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I'm serious I mean honestly since making photographs is just what I want to do yeah the first images I saw I saw of yours was the stuff you did in Hong Kong and really nice and you do this uh, interesting sort of panoramic prints where you're mashing up multiple images. So they all they they all look like they're one singular photograph, but they're not. I really like that because it's I, I saw you seeing street photographs not just as a singular image, seeing the relationship between them and, and evoking something more other than just sort of the quintessential street moment. Right. Was that something that started developing after you had gotten back or were you already you were doing that when you were back in Hong Kong? No. So my street extended because they're individual photographs that I do put together to make a new reality. That It happened very serendipitous, I suppose, in a way, not without a lot of work. Mm-hmm. But back in college, I had put photographs like diptychs together and, yeah. and different things like that. So it's it was something that I had done. I had 4,000 photographs. I had gone back to Hong Kong in 2014. And in 2014, I had found myself there a month, and I really amassed like 4,000 new photographs. Came back to to, um, Santa Ana, and I just kind of left them there for a year. I mean, I I knew I had something, but I was really busy with the kids and everybody who needed me. And then I had a moment where I started to look at them, and I I had a mentor. I I worked with Jim Friedman for six months, and he helped me hone what I was seeing on the street and he was kept pushing me, you know, let's, you know, go further, go deeper, do. And then one day I woke up and I started playing with them and I sent him like diptychs and then I sent him a triptych and I had put them together and he was like, I wish I had done that. (laughs) And I was like, oh, (laughs) okay. And so I had made the first street extended, which was bird market out of a photograph that I knew I really loved, but I didn't, but I didn't, you know, we're inundated with photographs outside here. Yeah. And I know that for me, it's been really important for me to find my own point of view and my own mm-hmm. way of speaking and my own vocabulary. And that was that was my beginning. Yeah, because I've, I've been thinking a lot about moving beyond the singular image. Because mm-hmm. I think every photographer gets to the point, or hopefully gets to the point, where they can put more than competent image together right. consistently. right. And then once you're able to do that, what next? Mm-hmm. Do you just keep doing that? 
because it, it, it becomes... It's boring. Yeah, it's boring. Because I get bored. I, I was listening to a National Geographic photographer for who made the point. And so if, you, if you're doing this long enough, you get to the point that you're, you're really good. Mm-hmm. The pictures that you used to be satisfied with, you're no longer satisfied with, and the bar that you have to hit right. just goes higher and higher. And I related so much to that. And, and and part of my awareness is the fact that no individual image is going to really do it for me. I can, you know, try to push it in terms of things I'm doing compositionally with light, right? But this only so far that will take me, and it's only when I take the next step and try to explore narrative themes ideas feelings right th- that the images really take on a life because they look at street photography just as a, a, a practice mm-hmm. that's it it's just practicing the techniques that i have to apply somewhere else and unless i'm willing to do that it's not going to come out so that's what i've been observing in your work is the fact that you've been diving deep Right. You know, and going into some very uncomfortable places, which I give kudos for you for being able to do that. Because I know it's not, I know it's not easy. So that's a good segue for your <laughs> your betrayal series. So, yeah. if, you know, you can tell us as much as you feel comfortable with telling us about that. Well, you know, my, my significant other, who is my ex-significant other, he has, he made other choices. And in making other choices... It ran over a few people, and he's very sorry for it. But in his, in his choices, there was a lot of pain mm-hmm. inflicted. And at first, all I was worried and concerned about was my two children. And Alexi was really little at the time, middle school, you know, when things okay. were breaking loose. And it was, it was all, all I wanted to do was protect my babies. So I was, I was working on that, and I love so deeply, you know. So I, I in order to understand what I was going through, I turned the camera on myself. And I was alone during the day. The kids are in school. Skylar was away at college. And I would wake up in writhering in pain and Mm -hmm. didn't have any friends really that, I mean, nobody, you know, I have, I had great support, but nobody local, great support. And you were here or? I was in Orange County. Orange County. Okay. Yeah. A little difficult. Anyway, so the camera and and making these photographs of me really as low as one can emotionally possibly go. And then I, I started, I was working with James and, and he was, you know, he said, you know, think about all the different photographers and all the different kind of techniques. And he threw out like thousands of names at me and he's like, do this, do that. And so I started working with multiple cam multiple in, in camera exposures. Mm-hmm. And I, you know, I started with two, then I started with three and then I started, you know, and, I, and then I was like settled in three it was really interesting. And I put my camera on the tripod and I, you know, I take a shower and I do like, and it was just exploring for the sake of getting the pain out. Mm. Yeah. It, it, and it's definitely helped get me through it. And in getting through it, there's something that has transcended, I think, into my photographs that have, you know, opened up a conversation. Yeah. Tell me about the, the first pictures you made and when you took a look at them, what surprised you? Oh, well, when you're turning the camera on yourself, I would be, you know, you want to look pretty. You want to look pretty, you want to look whatever. And then that those are awful. I mean, that's just, mm-hmm. you know, stupid, stupid stuff, you know. And then so you look at yourself and you kind of, okay, you just have to let it go. You have to rip off all the Band-Aids because otherwise the photograph doesn't have anything there. There's no essence. There's no guts. And, and that's what I wanted to like, that's what I was trying to get out of me because mm-hmm. I was in pain. We're just one episode away from celebrating our 500th episode in our 14th year of production. What started off as an interesting idea that I had while I was stuck in traffic has blossomed into a show listened to by thousands of people all over the world. I'm so proud of what I and my team have managed to put together with the help of all our guests. Each episode has provided something special, a unique resource for anyone from anywhere who has a passion and a love for photography. But it's also been listeners like you 
who have helped us in so many ways, like getting the word out on the show, allowing us to invest in better recording equipment, and even produce the Candid Frame app, which has been available and free for all listeners to listen to. You can help us to continue more years of work like this by contributing to our Patreon effort. Help us to increase our supporters from just 3% to 5% today by contributing as little as $5 a month. It's a small amount, but it makes a huge difference. So visit us at patreon.com forward slash the candor frame and become a Patreon supporter today. Thank you. When you're making those kinds of pictures that are so, so revealing, sharing them can be a very challenging thing Mm -hmm. because it's not just someone making a comment about the photographs, they're making a comment about you. Mm. And and I think that's the reason why a lot of people don't share pictures because they feel like if the images are being rejected, I'm going to be rejected. Mm. And I think that's also one of the reasons why people are very slow to make work that's very personal, Mm -hmm. right? Tell me about that. Wasn't the case for you? You're shaking your head. Yeah, because I, you know, so when I, I've been actually I do a lot of self portraits, but I never feel like they're me. You know, it's huh, it's really okay. yeah. I, I mean, as soon as I turn the camera and I, I it's like I'm like the Instagram that you've done up mm-hmm. to my 60th birthday. It was like oh, it's a challenge. I'm looking at the square and I've turned, I've flipped, you know, the camera around and I'm looking at myself, but no, I'm no longer looking at me. Mm-hmm. I'm now looking at the the light on my on the person's face that I'm looking you know it's all no, okay. t- completely transcended and so that's all of the photographs that I've ever taken of me that's what happens as soon as I'm in front of the camera with my camera turned on me it's no longer personal yeah. it's personal but it's not me yeah I kind of so when you're producing these photographs do the themes or the ideas come as a result of you just experimenting with the camera. You know, I wake up in the morning a lot of the times and I am, I don't know why, but it's like, it's a lot of the photographs that I've made for the Betrayal series came from literally whatever was planned that day is not happening and I have to make photographs. I don't have a photograph in mind. Mm -hmm. It's just this compulsion that something needs to be created today. I don't know why. I don't know where it's coming from. And it's just like this, this thing that comes over me and I just I listen and I do it and and then I'm like and I know exactly when to stop like I I just go down that rabbit hole sometimes it's an hour sometimes it's three and then it's just like oh it's done it's so interesting well you you talked about that the people who've looked at these photographs that it creates a dialogue because I Mm -hmm. think everyone has had the experience of of heartbreak Mm -hmm. and romantic betrayal at Mm -hmm. one point or another Tell me about the reactions that you've you've witnessed as a result of people looking at this work and looking at basically your your experience, your emotional journey on on paper, up on a wall, or in a portfolio. Yes. Well, it just happened. You know, this is the first time. What a week and a half ago, January fourth, mm-hmm. that was the first time I've ever had them out in public view like that. I mean, people have come to the house because I've had them framed for a little bit. You know, it was fascinating. My kids were at the opening for Project 15, New Perspectives in Photography, and I asked everybody's permission before I made these photographs. So I Mm -hmm. asked my kids, you know, when I started photographing four or five years ago myself and and everything around me that through this process, and David, I asked him, and I, whatever I, you know, that everybody was okay with what I was doing, because I realized that I'm not alone in this journey. We were all healing and we're all exploring. And so what happened the other night at Project at the opening was I had two psychiatrists come up to me and say, <laughs> seriously, they were like, love it. Oh my God, we get it. It's, you know, it's so much bigger than you. And I'm like, oh, you just made my night, hmm. you know, because it is bigger than me. It's my personal story. But we have, we have a lot of people that have, we've lost We've lost the ability to understand how important communication is. And if we're unhappy, we need to talk to each other. We don't need to like, we need to confront our issues before we decide to stray or to hurt people. Mm -hmm. And if my story that was very difficult can help people, you know, understand the pain that is inflicted 
when people don't take the time to say, look, I'm not unhappy. I'm unhappy. This isn't mm-hmm. working for me anymore. What can we do? Let's, let's do this the proper way. Yeah. That just would be so much better. So that's, I think, the dialogue. And as I found kind of, in a, it's been very positive. Yeah. What I, what I like about the work for me is that it takes something that's incredibly internal and it makes it into something beautiful. Because I remember when I was in, the, in, in a similar place mm-hmm. and I, I internalized everything. Mm-hmm. I didn't create any work from it. I didn't talk to anybody about mm-hmm. it. it I, just, I just lived with this, mm-hmm. lived with this for years. Oh, that's awful. Ah, it's terrible. It's terrible. So when I look at those, those photographs, um, that's why I admire the work so much, just your ability to be able to put it out there in, in that way. And as you said, I think a lot of people will see it and see a part of themselves in it, even if they didn't experience those those exact same right. circumstances. And I think that's that's really kind of the beauty of, of, of photography that it can do that without any sort of words. Right. Yeah. I don't really. I, I don't really like using words so much. Although people say I talk a lot, but I really prefer to make photographs. I prefer, and I love beauty. And I, as you said, I don't think. Something has to be, doesn't necessarily have to look like blood and guts or gore or pain or to deliver the message of those things. So that was really amazing. I mean, I was blown. I did not plan these photographs. They came through me, you know, that, you know, that's how it works. You know, we, it just, it, it was a gift. So how many images would you say you've produced for the series? Oh, there's a lot. But in terms of what you intend to print, do you have like a number of... Well, so I have different work. So the the photographs that are hanging right now, I have um, about, I don't know, maybe 15 that are, that are cut photographs. Mm-hmm. So they are pinhole photographs or multiple in-camera exposures that I've printed. And then there's probably two or three photographs that make the one photograph. That's a complex part of the project. Yeah. And then I have other work that has been done with one layer of of a photograph that could be multiple expo- exposure, but then a layer over top and reprinted. It's it's all brand new. I mean, I've started in January trying to hone it into a body of work. Mm-hmm. And it's it's kind of big. So how do you contend with it being big? How do you how do you keep it manageable? Well, I don't know yet. I'm kind of <laughs> I don't I know that I have I don't know. How about that? I don't no, know. That's a good answer. I'm hoping that I get to share it in a new in another way with other people. I would love it to to have a collaborative with mm. men and women sharing different stories in a powerful way to change behavior. Yeah. I would like to change behavior. Well, you're really on fire in terms of getting your work out there. I and mean, we've just talked about Instagram briefly, but you've, you're exhibiting the work. Tell me about that. You obviously have the experience to be able to, you have the skill set from all that we've talked about before in terms of hustling and to sort of make that happen. How does it feel to be doing all that for yourself? Well, I've been really, really lucky. I've met really lovely people. Eileen Smithson's class and workshop has been, you know, beyond amazing. She gave me skills a year and a half ago that I didn't know how to do anything. And I, and I absorbed every last ounce that she's given me and continues to share with us. I don't know. I just, I just, every day I get up and I just do my thing. I just... It's coming at me from all different directions. And sometimes I get an email, you know, I get emails from friends from all over the place that love, that are photographers and say, oh, you should enter this or you should put your yeah. work there. And I'm, and sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't. And, and so it's just been, I don't know, it's just been organic, really. I've been really busy making the work more so than getting it out. And what's happened is, is that I was so busy making the work that everything just kind of fell in the same time frame of it ex- being exposed. Oh, okay. So it just happens that it all fell 
at the same time, Saren, you know, because this show, Project X, was supposed to be in the old stu- in the old Wilcox location for LACP mm-hmm. back in December, and I was going to miss the show. I was in Mexico, so because of the whole move, I got lucky. And it was moved to January, so I was here for it. And then the Perceived Me show is going on. I mean, it's just very luck of the draw that everything's kind of happening at the same time. And in the midst of all this, are you still making those sort of everyday pictures? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yep, I work really hard at it. You know, I've had two, both my kids have been home for the last week and a half. and, And so it's a little harder. And with the shows, and I'm new to this, having, you know, delivering work and, um, I just I've never done any of this stuff before, so I'm a little not doing it every day, mm-hmm. and I'm promoting the shows, which is new for me. But I'll go back to it. I mean, I'm making photographs. What do your kids think of the work when they see it? They're really proud of me. <laughs> yeah, I got that from your daughter when yeah, I met her. They're really they're. I mean, they've watched me. I, so I have to tell you, this is just so I when I was in Santa Ana, and Alexi, they're they're in school and they're doing their thing, and I was really working on my craft. Okay, I was working on learning my lighting skills better. I was working, so I did a lot, of, tons of free things, and so I had Alexi. My kids have always been my assistants. <laughs> and so I wanted I was a friend of mine's daughter was pregnant and I wanted to do a pregnancy shoot as a gift for her, her daughter and so I wanted I had to do a test shoot of how I thought I was going to do the whole pregnancy thing so I had Alexi come with me I was another person's lawn and so I had Alexi and Alexi I said Alexi you know lay down on the ground and she lays down and she's like all awkward. I'm like, hello. Okay. So I lay down on the ground and I said, take a picture of me just so I can get an idea of what it looks Mm -hmm. like. And the picture was like really not okay. And I said, Alexi, sweetheart, you got to like, give me like a little bit of framing here. Like you're an artist. Like you, and she looked at me, she says, you know, mom, photography, it's just not, it's really not an art form. I know she's changed like she's my biggest fan she did my website she's like my assistant she's working with me next week no she she totally gets it now but that was you know back then Mm -hmm. so that's so they've been with me on my journey and they've watched me when I was by my you know working all day long in Orange County with like I'd be at my computer I'd be shooting I'd be coming home I'd be processing I'd be making dinner and I'm like what are you doing mom you know why Mm -hmm. you know and so they're super proud. That's nice. That's nice. So let's get back to the talk about community, because I know you've made a lot of connections in, in the last couple of years. Mm-hmm. And and talk to me about how those relationships different for you today than they were in the past. What role do they play now that they would never have played before? My community? Yeah. Oh, they're amazing. I mean, Sia Foreman, she was, I met Sia in the next and I don't know, we saw each other from afar and she was my touchstone. So I was sitting in Santa Ana trying to figure out Lexi's at college and Skyler's off. And I was in Orange County and I'm like, I'm driving to LA two and three times a week, which mm-hmm. is awful. And I said to her, I really want to move to LA. And she said, absolutely, you can do it. I mean, I didn't know anybody. See ya. I knew yeah. a few people. And I just said, okay. So it was kind of like, Oh, she held my hand. She said, of course you can. And then Sia, Sia was wonderful. She took me to different openings when I first got here. And she, she got my feet wet. And then she introduced me to people. And then, you know, different people came along. And there's just lovely people here. I'm so thrilled to be in Los Angeles right now at this time where um, the energy is ecstatic. The people are welcoming, warm, full of a lot of excitement for the medium and they've they've included me. It's amazing. Yeah. I mean, I haven't been here very long. Oh, well, you're making the most of it. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, yeah, well every day does count. Um, I was keeping up on your Instagram uh, leading up to your 60th birthday. Mm-hmm. And that was for me <laughs> That was that was really amazing. It was fun. I I don't know. I don't think I'd do it. Uh, <laughs> it was but, fun. Yeah, but, but but tell me about that because each day you were posting something um, leading up to your birthday. You're doing it again your self portrait, and you'd have a little bit of text between mm-hmm. it as as the caption. Tell us about that. Yeah. Well, it's a big number, sixty. 
It was a very big number. And I was like, really, the whole year, I've said it a lot of times, and I was like, oh my God, I don't know how to do this. But it was coming. And I just figured, you know, I had, I was in Mexico and I had this dialogue with people, which I didn't know I could have with Instagram. I've never, it was new. And I said, okay, they had given me a lot of support. And I said, okay, I need that support again, getting leading up to my birthday. And I'm just going to, I don't know. I just said, I have nothing to lose. And, but it was such a challenge to try to make those portraits, to make them different, you know, different from what you've done before or different from each other, just different from each other. You know, when you're just doing yourself in your house or mm-hmm. trying to make a photograph, you, you do run out of like, interesting angles and stuff. So I would try to make a photograph and it, and it would sometimes take all day long to make that photograph. Really? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I just, it wouldn't, it wasn't coming. I'd have like, oh, I have a spare one. Maybe I'll use that. Mm. And then all of a sudden something would happen. The light would come up, out a certain way. I'd catch something, I'd see something and everything would fall into place. And I'd be like, okay, I got it. But it was really mm. interesting because it was a challenge. It's one thing to have the challenge of shooting every day. Mm -hmm. It's another challenge when you have something that's that's very specific that you have to do. Right, right. And I strayed a little bit, you know, I strayed a little bit. There was uh, from my self-portraits during that session. And it was so funny because people actually commented and they'd comment and they'd be like worried about me or that wasn't very pretty of you or something. And I'd be like, well, that's not really the idea. (laughs) You know, I'm not really going for pretty. I'm not going for ugly. I'm going for a feeling and getting that feeling across. And I didn't even have a feeling that I was trying to get across. It was, it's organic. Yeah, that was one that you did recently, which is similar to, I guess, a portrait that you did of someone else that I saw on your Instagram, Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. where it's sort of a layered Mm -hmm. thing. It's the same person, uh, same body, but from different uh, different positions mm-hmm. and they're mashed up together. So you don't know exactly what's coming from mm-hmm. where and which. And that, for me, I lo- really look at that. And that was really, really interesting. Yeah. Uh, did that idea sort of just come from playing? Well, that, so my triple in camera exposure is something I've been doing for, I don't know, five, six years. I came to LA. I did double exposure on the, on Hollywood Boulevard. I have a series like that. And so I knew, so I had, I had the honor or whatever, Christine Shoemaker, she asked me in May if I would be part of this Perceive Me project. So I went away and I knew I was going to shoot her in July. And so in my head, I wanted to do triple and camera exposure. I'm like, I want to do that. So the photograph I posted is the test is, oh, for okay. shooting okay. her. And you. so once I did that photograph of me, triple in camera exposure. I was like, okay. And I had never done a portrait before that photograph, triple in camera of me. That was the, so once, so that was like, okay, I know I can do it. I don't know how it will work, but she'll work with me. And that's how, that's how I did it. I I, I got a question that I know a lot of people are going to ask or want to ask, want Mm -hmm. me to ask. Mm -hmm. Why choose to do it in camera rather than just, creating layers in Photoshop. Because I don't know how to do Photoshop. (laughs) (laughs) And everybody tries to teach me, and I just can't do it. Oh, I love that answer. (laughs) I love that answer. Yeah. Yeah, it's not not, not some, oh, no, I just want to, I just want to be surprised. No. I love that. (laughs) No, Uh, no, that's the truth. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I, I, because I kind of favor that because you get surprised. Oh, it's amazing. Oh, my goodness. When So to go to Christine Shoemaker's shoot, we shot in my bedroom. And I, I bought my house because it's got north light. It's beautiful. Light. Yeah, I've seen that picture of your window. I'm yeah, envious. it's magical. So I have this beautiful light. And I'm, I'm shooting her, and I'm shooting her from one, like I did my, my test, mm-hmm. all the same position, you know, me kind of going back and forth. And all of a sudden, I started to play. Now I'm into it. Like, I'm 
into the idea of what's happening in my layers. And that's what I, that's what I love. The whole idea of the magic, I could see like where the first layer started and I said, okay, now look sideways. And then I drew myself back. And when I made the photograph that I have in the show, and I've got a couple other ones that are actually almost as good, Mm -hmm. but that one's the, the winner. I said to her, okay, we're done. I was like, I knew I was like the mat, like I could just see that everything kind of worked. And it was such like, you talk about magic moment. Mm -hmm. I said, let's go look at the computer. And I put it up there and I was like, oh my God, I did it. And that was like, I had never done that before. And what was her reaction? She thought that was rather cool. (laughs) (laughs) I don't, you know, it wasn't the full impact because, you know, it's tiny. And she was like, oh, okay, that's cool. But then I, you know, sent it to her and she's like, oh yeah, that works. Yeah, it's super fun. That's great. Yeah. Well, Anyways. I, look, I look forward to seeing more of that kind of work. Yeah, I love future. it. Yeah. That's I'm into it. Well, my last question mm-hmm. that I ask each guest is I ask them to recommend another photographer for our listeners to discover and explore. And it can be anyone, someone you've long admired or someone you've recently discovered. So who would the photographer be and why? Well, I'm going to say that I admire, I respect, and I really appreciate Colin Finley. Mm-hmm. I met Colin Finley a year ago. And we went to see Stephen Shore with Debbie Arlick. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I was there. Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. yes. Uh-huh. We were in the front. And yeah. I was hanging on every word that Stephen Shore said. And I met Colin that night. And I don't know. I didn't know his work then. I didn't know anything about him. But, but we've gotten to be friends. And his empathy and the work that he's done. And he writes music. And he's putting together a movie. And it's his soul. That's what it is. Mm. So he takes pictures and it's all about the soul that he's sharing with the world. And I relate to that. And I think that that's what we want to do as a community of photographers and artists is we want to reach people through our work. And I think he does that. And you're certainly doing it too. Thank you. Thank Thank you so much. Thank you, Baronex. Thanks to Ellen for her generosity and her time. Find out more about her and her work by visiting ellenfriedlanderphotography.com. I have several workshops coming up this year. The first one is next month in Los Angeles as part of LA Street Week held by the Los Angeles Center of Photography. It's a week-long event with presentations, workshops, and exhibits. I'll be teaching a half-day workshop in Hollywood, but there will be other sessions as well with other photographers. You can find out more by clicking on the link on our site or visiting lacphoto.org. I'll be in Washington, D.C. for the Focus on the Story Festival in the fall and a Momenta Photographic Workshop in August, as well as my week-long workshop in Tokyo in December. I'll be providing more details on these as they become available. If you're a devoted listener and subscribe to the show, write us and review wherever you listen to podcasts. These reviews have led people to take a chance on our show and allowed us to grow. Thanks to Matej Vanek from the Czech Republic for his review. Along with my recent book, Making Photographs, Developing a Personal Visual Workflow, I just released my latest ebook, Nine Pictures, Nine Stories, Volume 2. The first one got a great response, and I'm back with a follow-up where I discuss the stories behind nine images that I created last year. It's only $8, and your purchase is another way you can support the show. Purchase that and any of my previous ebooks by visiting the website at thecandorframe.com. You can also subscribe to our YouTube channel and our mailing list. On the YouTube channel, I offer critiques on images submitted by TCF listeners like you, while the mailing list keeps you updated with all TCF events, including special events, workshops, and more. Sign up today. And remember, you can support the show by contributing to our Patreon effort or donating through PayPal. Thanks to Chris Hollington for his recent contribution. And if you found that you can't find every episode of the show to listen to, download the Candor Frame app, which is available for both Apple iOS and Android. And because of your generosity, it's free to download and use. No additional purchases are required. The Candor Frame's audio engineer is Martin Taylor, where you can find the other martintaylor.com. The show's senior producer is Cynthia Parker. And our music is from Kevin McLeod, whose royalty free music can be found at incompetech.com. And this is Ibarian X, and this is The Candor Frame. <laughs>